Every new generation of Christian must learn what it means to live by faith in God. The God who has redeemed us from our sin and who set us on this path to glory. But that, of course, isn't a one-off lesson where suddenly we are strong in faith and we go on with ease and comfort. No, this is a lifetime of learning where we continually must move from self-trust to taking God at his word in every and each situation that faces us. Last week, if you joined us on Zoom, we emphasized from the life of Abraham that the life of faith focuses in on our future inheritance with Christ and our home in heaven. It lives here on earth with our hearts up there with him. But that doesn't imply that this faith that we have is this kind of airy fairy bubble in the sky or some kind of ethereal dream or some vague hope. What we see this morning emphasized in the life of Moses is that faith is very, it's very earthy. What I mean by that is true faith is gritty. It's messy. It gets its hands dirty. It's involved in all the real hardships of life. It responds in particular ways to painful situations. Faith turns its hand to every part of life lived here on earth. There's no segment where we say, I live here by faith, and I live here by my own wisdom. No, faith is involved in all the nitty-gritty of life. There's a way to bring up Christ. What a privilege this morning. See a baby in church. Well, not see one. <laughs> Completely covered, but the first time. But there's a way to bring up crying babies and changing nappies by faith. There's a way to respond to superpowers and government rules by faith. Faith looks at status and money and identity with a very certain particular mindset and response. From the cradle to the grave, it's this very earthy faith that must carry us along its current to heaven and to Christ. And it's this real-time faith that we see in the life of Moses. We meet him, don't we, in verse 23, as a crying baby floating helplessly on a river. And we were introduced to his parents and the atmosphere of his home life. And you remember that his family even brought him up when he was taken to Pharaoh's house. And what we see, first of all, in the life of Moses is that faith is a very risk-taking leadership. Faith has this real mindset towards leading others that is not averse to taking risks. So in verse 23, we discover Moses' parents leading his home by faith. And then at the end of this little section, in verse 29, we see Moses himself leading God's people by faith. And if you notice, this section is bracketed by faith-filled leadership of men and women who are faced with troubled waters, the Nile in the beginning and the Red Sea at the end. Moses' parents in the beginning and Moses himself at the end. Moses, God's people were faced with these dangerous waters where the enemies of God were chasing them down, seeking to drown them, seeking to kill them. But it is faith-filled leadership that got them to the other side. A superpower is brought to its knees by these pressurized parents hiding their baby in some bulrushes because they knew that God could do the impossible. And superpowers have no influence on a baby deliverer when God is on the side of the baby. Now, what hope this holds out to these first century Christians to which this book of Hebrews is written? These Christians were tempted to give up in the face of Roman opposition. They had the superpower against them. And there were just a handful of Christians here in Rome. And this book is written to them to remind them that they are to live by faith even when superpowers are against them. And they're reminded of this baby brought up in this family of faith 
who were told by Pharaoh to throw their baby into the river Nile. Pharaoh was so troubled by the growing strength of this increasing nation within his own borders that he seeks to destroy the new generation coming up so that they won't overcome him in the future. So Moses' parents are faced with this horrific dilemma. Do they save their own skins by obeying God and his word? Or do they protect their child and risk their own lives? Now, not fully known to them, of course, is that in risking their lives, they would save their nation later on. But that is always the principle of faith, isn't it? A faith that says, I am willing to take up my cross now. I'm willing to lose everything now because God promises that if I give up everything for him now, he will save my life later on. I will lose everything temporarily, maybe, and I'm willing to do that in order to gain the eternal. So Jesus said, didn't he, <clears throat> be willing to lose your life now for my sake and for the gospels, and then I will save your life in the future. And maybe this kind of principle of faith is in the back of their minds as they respond with faith in God's power to protect their baby and to save them down the line. After all, the reason, if you look at verse 20. Three, there's a very unusual reason for given, given for saving this baby. He was a beautiful child. That's a very strange reason. I'm going to save Moses because he's a beautiful child. Well, that's a bit bizarre, isn't it? What if, what if he was an ugly baby? Would they have, you know, oh, well, <laughs> I'm saving this guy. It's a very strange turn of phrase, isn't it? But I think Acts chapter 7 verse 20 hints at the interpretation of what all this means. Because there it says that Moses was beautiful in God's sight. And that implies that there was kind of a, a special and visible favor of God upon him. Moses' parents look at him and there's something peculiar, something unusual, something that strikes them about Moses that says... God's hand is upon this boy. By faith, I must respond. I must give up my own life. I must risk my very safety in order to fulfill God's requirements, God's plan for this baby boy. So realizing that God has this special purpose for him ensures that they risk everything to save him. What we see here are these parents in a very vulnerable situation. They're understanding that true faith must take risks. God's people cannot play it safe. We don't need to play it safe, do we, when we're in the hands of the sovereign of heaven? Christian parents, we can be strongly tempted to be overprotective, to be risk averse when it comes to our children. Imagine God calls you to be missionaries in an unreached part of the world. You've got this dilemma, you've got these young children in your house and you feel the strong call of God upon your life and to go into an, the unknown, to take the gospel and what do you do? How do you respond to that? Do you take your children to this possibly dangerous place? Is that wise? Is that foolish? Well, in a, in a risk-averse, overly health and safety conscious society, to take your children to such a place would be the height of foolishness. But for the Christian, it can be the height of wise faith that rests on a God who will eternally care for you and your children, even if you all lose your lives for him. And that, is, that sounds strange to say when we're brought up in a culture that says, you can't think like that. Not for you or for your children, especially for your children. What we need to grasp is that if we lose our lives for the sake of the gospel, then God will be faithful in giving each one of us eternal safety 
with him. And so in order to lead our children by faith, we must be willing to take risks with them for the sake of the gospel in order to teach them whom we fully trust. If we lead our children with this risk-averse mentality, they will always think God cannot be trusted. What does it preach to our young people if we say, I will not do anything to put our family at risk. I will keep you safe myself. I will not allow you to go to places where you may be vulnerable for the gospel. Isn't that telling them that their safety is to be found in us rather than in God? As parents and adults within the church family, we are to lead young people with the example of faith And that means sometimes leaving our families and saying, I'm going to go and spread the gospel in risky places. Sometimes it means taking them with us. But what it does mean is we must stretch each other's faith. We must say to each other, we must prove to each other, God can be trusted in every circumstance. Of course, faith-filled parenting isn't easy, is it? quite the reverse, but it is by the stretch and pull of gospel-hearted, risk-taking, that our children grow to see that God is entirely trustworthy, that he provides, and that his word is true. Well, it's highly unlikely, of course, that as parents we'll have to hide our children in bulrushes, but it is an absolute necessity that we lead our homes, we lead our families, we lead our churches, our young people, with faith and say, God is trustworthy. Here we have Amram and Jochebed, Moses' parents. They couldn't pass their faith on to their children by like they passed on their genes. But they could create an atmosphere of faith within the home to exemplify to their children what a God-oriented life looks like. And that's what they do. That's what the parents do. And as the family takes care of Moses, as he grows up, Moses grows up with this idea in his head, it's worth giving up everything to follow God. And even though he's brought up in this environment of Pharaoh and his world-centered wealth and comfort, Moses, brought up by his own family, knows that God can be trusted and he is better and all of this comfort and wealth. And so it's no great surprise when we find all of Moses' parents' children growing up in faith. Aaron, their son, becomes a high priest. Miriam, their daughter, becomes a prophetess. Moses himself becomes the deliverer of God's people. And I wonder this morning whether this is the atmosphere that is in our homes. I wonder whether our children are seeing Christ as more wonderful than anything that this world offers and that God can be trusted. Brought up in such an environment, Moses becomes this heaven-centered young man and the deliverer of God's people. We find him here in verse 29 with a risk-taking faith leadership himself, just like his parents before him. If you look at verse 29, it says, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. And yet if you read the accounting back in Exodus, what you read there is that the people didn't really have faith. In fact, quite the opposite. They were constantly complaining, constantly whinging. And they say, they get to the Red Sea, and they turn to Moses, and they say, Have you not led us here because there weren't enough graves back in Egypt? There's not a great deal of faith in these people, but what this verse is pointing to is the faith leadership of Moses. As he urges people forwards to the apparent dead end of the Red Sea. And then he rallies them there to trust God. God will see us through. He'll take us through these waters There's nothing to fear. 
Keep your heads up. Look to God. He is sovereign. We'll get through this. And by faith they did. Now, without over-elevating people in leadership, we often see throughout church history the way in which God uses individuals to lift the heads of God's people and say, come on, we can do this. We have a great God and we can go through this, this trial, this, this, this suffering, and we can live for the gospel no matter what. We see it in all the revivals, the missionary exploits, and even the Reformation, where God uses one person to drive through the barriers to bring salvation to the world. It isn't an over-exaggeration to say that God often uses faith-filled individuals to rally his troops and to rapidly expand his worldwide mission. And we need men and women in our church today with such a confidence to lead the church, to lead their homes, to lead the children's works, the young people's work, people of faith to say, God can do this. God can save them. God can use them mightily for his glory. Faith must mark all leadership. God can do what he says he can do may begin in a living room with a mum showing her children Christ. It may end with worldwide reformation and revival. We must nev- never underestimate the power of the example of faith-filled parents, people leading in the church. Well, secondly, we see here faith's mature choices. Verses 24 to 26. Faith's mature choices choices. What is a sign of spiritual maturity? Here Moses is 40 years of age, but that is not the primary indicator of maturity because there are spiritually childish 40-year-olds. But here is the sign, verses 24 and 25. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, when he was mature, chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now remember to whom this book of Hebrews was written. They were being faced with the very same choice. Would they choose a life of comfort in Rome by stopping going to church, by giving up on Christ, Or would they stand with God's people and face imprisonment or worse? That was their dilemma. Many were showing their spiritual immaturity. Chapter 10 says, by forsaking the assembling of themselves together. They'd given up on Christ. They were avoiding the inevitable persecution. They weren't identifying with God's people. And that was the exact reverse of Moses and the call of this book. The call of these verses is to make mature choices by faith. And what does that look like exactly? Well, there are many indications of a grown-up walk with Christ, aren't there? But here highlighted is this daily and stark choice between the world and all that it has to offer and Christ and all that he offers. And three aspects of that are highlighted here about what this stark choice looks like on the ground. These verses tell us that that choice between the world and Christ is one between class, comfort, and coin. I couldn't fit, fit another C in there. So class, comfort, and coin. You see, Moses had to choose between the status as son of Pharaoh's daughter or being outcast as a people of God. He had to choose between the comfort that the palace offered him and would give him and the suffering of being a Jew and that all that would bring. He had to choose between the wealth of his Egyptian family and the homelessness and poverty of the enslaved. 
Now, in most parts of the world, to choose Christ is to choose to be downgraded socially and materially. Maybe this, we have this constant push in Western Christianity, don't we, towards becoming the socially acceptable middle class, the wealthy, the comfortable, the ones who live in ease and comfort with few future earthly worries. But maybe, just maybe, I want you to think about that this week, to ask ourselves, is this one of our acceptable sins in Western Christianity? This constant striving to become acceptable and comfortable and wealthy instead of being willing to be downgraded and to give everything we have away for the sake of the gospel. It hardly feels wrong, does it, to live in a palace with untold wealth and ease? Maybe we'd look at Moses and say, Moses, God has placed you in this palace to have an influence on Pharaoh, and maybe you can help him expand his mind so that he treats God's people with respect, and he lets us have some measure of freedom. Maybe you can have a political influence there. You should appreciate your social upgrade so that you can use the influence for God. Hardly feels wrong when you think about it. But this wasn't a high enough calling for Moses. Moses wasn't called to have a certain measure of political influence. He was called by God to deliver God's people, to rescue them completely from Egypt. He was aiming much higher than comfort, class, and coin. He chose rather, it says, to be identified with the persecuted, chosen people of God. He chose rather the suffering, the shame, the scandal of the coming suffering Messiah. He chose rather to go wherever God led than what natural wisdom would cause him to think. Well, this is the highest of callings, is it not? Someone famously said, if God calls you to be a missionary, don't stoop to be a king. It's not sinful to be comfortable in itself, is it? But it can become sinful when it comes at the expense of living for Christ, fulfilling our calling, identifying with God's people. And this was the exact problem of the Hebrew Christians here in this book of Hebrews. It's entirely possible for us as we get older to long for a life of greater ease, of greater comfort, but that is not a sign of growing maturity. Spiritual maturity tends towards being less comfortable in this world, not more. And this verse distinguishes between the treasure and wealth of the world that is not necessarily sinful, and the fleeting pleasures of sin. And yet it tells us that Moses gave up both. He gave up both the legitimate pleasures and the sinful pleasures of the world in order to follow the will of God, in order to go where he was led by God. You see, the Christian life, it isn't just about fleeing temptation and sin, is it? It's about living for Christ. It's about bearing his shame. It's about taking his reproach. It's about giving up everything for Christ. It's having your heart detached from all the pleasures and wealth that we have and saying, I can take it or leave it because I have Jesus. Faith looks to the lasting joy of being with Christ as far superior to the temporary joy of the here and now. It looks with greater joy at the invisible than the visible. As one writer puts it, Moses chose the imper imperishable. He saw the invisible and he did the impossible. So may we with gaze fixed on Christ, mature in our faith by seeking a life that is truly successful, 
a life that is willing to give up everything for the glory of his name. And then lastly, in verse 28, we see faith's certainty of salvation. Faith's certainty of salvation. <clears throat> How would you respond if you were Moses and this verse, verse 28, was said to you? Verse 28, by faith Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Imagine God comes to you and he says, do you know the way to be rescued from death? Do you know the way to be rescued from Egypt? Do you know the way to be rescued from the, the angel of death that's going to pass over these houses tonight? Well, what I want you to do is I want you to kill your best lamb. I want you to dip your hyssop paintbrush in the blood and then paint the doorposts of your house. It's very unusual, isn't it? Very strange. If we were Moses, we might have asked, well, why that? Is there anything else that we can do? Or is there another way to be rescued? This sounds strange in my ears, but not Moses. He knew to take God at his word, however strange it sounded, however unusual. Because God knows what he is doing. He knows how to rescue his people. And even if it sounds really odd to us, it's not strange to God. He knows how to save his people. And Moses is confident that if God said it, then no further questions needed to be asked. He just needed to say, yes, Lord. You said it. This is the way you're going to save us. This is what we're going to do. This is a, a strange sounding salvation. And yet we know from history that as they did that, the angel of death passed over their houses, the houses that had obeyed in faith, and the people inside were saved. The firstborn of the Egyptian families without faith perished, but God's people were delivered from death and even delivered from Egypt. And every year since then, they have feasted upon this Passover to remember the past work of salvation, but also to look forward to a greater and even more unusual salvation in Jesus Christ. You know, God has never rescued his people in normal ways, has he? You read the Old Testament, you think, there is nothing normal about God's salvation plan. His rescues have always been as great as they are strange, none more so than the work that Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. As he dies upon the cross in fulfillment of the Passover celebrations, there on the cross 2,000 years ago, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was nailed to a tree to rescue sinners from their sin. The Son of God gave himself as a ransom for many. And the promise of God's word is that all who look to Christ dying on that tree and rising again on the third day, all who look to him by faith are forgiven all of their sin, washed clean, made new, given life, and restored to friendship with God. Now you think, well, that's unusual. That's strange that God should say such a thing that I must look to the dying Son of God. And our first reaction might be to say, well, I'm not sure about that. But may our second reaction this morning be to say, well, God said it. I believe it. And I trust alone in this unusual salvation. I trust in Jesus Christ to be forgiven and reconciled with God. Many people spend their entire lives looking for structured ways of salvation to rescue themselves from the mess of their lives, whether by religion or irreligion, by believing in a God or not believing in a God, or going here, there, finding satisfaction. I am going to rescue myself. 
by a, no, a more normal sounding salvation. And it never works. We never rescue ourselves. No other method can save us from eternal destruction and despair. Faith in the crucified Savior alone can forgive us, make us anew, make us right with God. However unusual this is to your ears this morning, will you come with Moses-like faith in God and say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Faith grasps hold of the rescue God gives, however unusual it sounds, and then enjoys the eternal benefits. So this morning, let us live in this world by faith, giving up everything for the surpassing joy of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. Before we take communion together,